Hi, Ross. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm I'm good. Congratulations on a on a. I, I assume you had an enjoyable night last night. Uh, more or less, yes. Uh, it, it was a relief. Um, I'm kind of a worrier, and I had been obsessively checking poll numbers for oh the previous three months, and and uh, now I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, and my condolences to you. I, I'm really sorry to hear about the fortunes of your party. I'm, I I accept the uh, condolences. Uh, however. Well, no, I, I, you're, you're sincere, right? You think America needs two strong, healthy, vibrant political parties? Uh, I do. I'm not sure that we have two at the moment, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I think we, we do. Of course, the, the Republican Party will now uh, you know, retreat into the wilderness and regroup and seek a path back to power. And one thing I was wondering is whether you know of any books that could serve as a trail guide, uh, any, maybe books published this year that the Republican Party could consult. I think David Frum wrote a pretty good book, uh, Come Back, A Conservatism That Can Win Again. Um, gracious, gracious of you to say that, but the one I'm thinking of has a picture of an elephant in a hat on the... What, 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 what's the name of that book? Uh, Bob, it's, it's really escaping me at the moment. Uh, I doubt it. You doubt that? Um, I, sorry. D- my, my, should I say it? Should I say it? You're no, so I'll, No, no, I'll, I'll say it. So, yeah, so, no, I... Wait, no, I have the book. I can do the... I can do the great... The same thing Raihan and I did together on Blogging Heads. I will... Again, hold it up to the camera, point out the elephant with with his with his hat on, yeah. and say, "Yeah, um, it's it's an amazing blueprint." Um, I've been my, my only worry, frankly, and you know this this shouldn't dissuade anyone watching from rushing out to buy the book, but that it was you know is that it's an excellent bl- blueprint for the Republican Party circa two thousand or two and two or so on domestic policy, and that maybe it's been overtaken by events. Uh-huh. Ross, I believe the people in marketing at your publisher are would just, like to have a word. No, with you. no, I know they're just stabbing themselves in the <laughs> in, in in the eye with with the long with long knives. No, I'm sure you, you deal in eternal verities, and I'm sure there's lasting significance. So I do want to get, uh, and, and I, in fact, I know for a fact that your your prescription is very relevant to the wither of the Republican Party question. Um, so we will get into that. I wanted to step back quickly and ask for your reaction to last night's festivities. What did you think of the two speeches, McCain's and Obama's? Well, I mean, I, you know, you, you get sort of caught up in the moment. I mean, I thought, you know, I thought it was pretty remarkable. Um, I, I think that McCain gave easily the best speech he's given in the entire campaign, I'd say. And Well, don't you think concession speeches are kind of his natural genre? And they're, they're, such, a, they're such a good vehicle for patriotism and honor. Yeah, and, and tragedy in the sense, I think it was possibly the New Republic that did a, a big piece on Mark Salter, uh, earlier earlier in the year, and it talked about McCain's concession speech in 2000, um, and just sort of, and and then his convention speech, I think, in 2000, and how it was sort of shot through with these strains of, you know, I've served my country, and I will probably not live to see the next great chapter in her history, and so on. And you could, you know, you could hear echoes of that throughout the speech, and and there was, I don't know, I mean, you know, there might. There's a sense you don't want to over psychoanalyze candidates, obviously. Although that's what um, no, you do do for a living. I mean, you can see. Yeah, there's a sense in which John McCain seems most he's most comfortable campaigning from behind. um, But that I I think a corollary of that might be that you know there's a sense in which he's most comfortable in defeat. You know, with the with the lost cause and the sort of. you know, the near miss and the sort of gracious handoff to, in this case, the younger generation, and in this case to Barack Obama, who, you know, I hadn't been wild at all about Obama's convention speech. I thought uh, it was sort of overstaged, not because, like, you know, whatever, they want to do Greek columns, that's that's fine, but it's sort of, he felt almost diminished to me by the sheer size of that setting, and then he gave what I thought was in that context, and maybe it obviously worked out for him, he won the election, but he gave a, a pretty partisan, at times harshly partisan speech attacking McCain and so on. I thought this speech last night, and again, it's, you know, it's easier to give gracious speeches in victory than to give gracious speeches in the middle of the campaign, but sure I thought is. it was, you know, I thought it was one of his better speeches. I thought, <laughs> you know, if you aren't moved by the story of the 106-year-old woman and the changes in our country that she's lived through, you know, you probably aren't moved by much in, Ameri- in American history, and, you know, just, I mean, all of the sort of, they're cliches, but they're true. It is remarkable to see America elect an African American, and, and oh, it's and totally, it's totally remarkable, and um, I feel great about it. I mean, I mean, it's 
it's not a it's not a guaranteed good in the sense that it could. Well, you know, Jackie Robinson breaking into the big leagues was great, but it could have set the cause back if uh, it turned out he couldn't control his temper under provocation and so on. What did you say? Oh, I was going to say if he hit 227, but yeah, no. Well, I, no, if, if he reinforced negative stereotypes. Right. And, and, if, and if the Obama presidency doesn't work out in certain ways, it's conceivable that it could convince the nation that, you know, or, or people who want to be convinced of this, no, don't, don't vote black again. So that's not a guaranteed good. Um, I, do, I do think one thing that is intrinsically good is personally is just that the McCain style of campaign did not work. That, that uh, you know, I, I think the nation's better off if, if we think that, you know, calling people terrorists is not an effective campaign strategy. But I, yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I, don't, but, I don't remember when McCain called Obama uh, a terrorist, but... but yeah. No, well, someone in the campaign made the association, as I recall. But the uh, But anyway, I mean, as for Obama's speech, I mean, I, uh, I don't know. I, whenever I hear a politician's speech, uh, I imagine what it would have been like if I had written it. And oddly enough, I always prefer the version I would have written, you know. Um, and I kind of, I, 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 I mean, I guess I'm just a stingy person. I haven't heard anybody else who had any complaints about it. But uh, looking at it, I just thought job one was trying to start winning over the many skeptics and critics uh, of Obama, mm -hmm. many of whom had become embittered in part because of the the, the McCain campaign's uh, rhetoric. And looking at the speech from their point of view, if you put themselves yourself in their shoes, I thought it was a little too uh, well self self consciously historic, a little too uh, kind of immediately majestic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, not earthy enough, uh, not straight, not, not earthy enough in its appeal to those voters and straightforward enough. Um, and I, I think if you're one of those people, if you're a skeptic, yeah, uh, it, 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 the, that opening, that very opening passage sounded like he was saying, well, the fact that I won is a vindication of these great values. If McCain had won, of course, it wouldn't have been. I mean, that's the way they're going to see that, I think. And uh, so... Yeah, no, I take, I take your point. I, I think that, and then this goes back to what I said about the convention speech, I think that from my point of view as, you know, a conservative who wasn't going to vote for Obama but wanted to be sort of swept up in the historic nature of his victory if he won, Yeah, I think it was, I mean, the speech reached me. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, yeah, it was, not, it was not a speech calculated to appeal to someone who didn't already want to be caught up in the sweep of history. But that being said, I think that if you watch, if you follow the general election campaign um, throughout, the Obama campaign was incredibly careful to avoid, and from the convention speech onward, avoid these sort of historical resonances and mm -hmm. sort of really mm -hmm. focusing on the fact that, hey, we're going to elect a black guy. Isn't that crazy slash great? Um, yeah. And I think that there, you know, he, he's going to have an inaugural speech that's going to probably strike different notes um i i wanted to see him wallow in it i guess that's not really the right word wallow but glory glory, glory in it better word yeah, yeah I, I wanted to see that at some point and i don't think that this speech went over the top in that in that regard but yeah you know i mean look like i mean we're 40 years 47 years not however many 44 years since the civil rights act um you know, two generations removed from basically apartheid in half the country. Uh, you know, you want, I mean, I don't like Jesse Jackson, but I, I, want, I want to see Jesse Jackson crying. You know, you want to see yeah. these things, and I think it's, it's okay for one night for the Obama campaign to give that to us, and I don't think, um, I don't think it overstepped. You know, I mean, no, it, it was not a speech that, it was not a speech that, um, it was not a Clintonian speech, I guess. Bill Clinton yeah, was a master of giving a speech, and at the end of a speech, even if you disagreed with him going right. in, you you were like, "Wow, he's really he's really with me. He gets it." This wasn't that kind of speech, but I, I think that's okay. Yeah, I, I don't think he has Clinton's pitch perfect sense for the moment, but uh, but it, look, it, it was great. And I mean, speaking of the Civil Rights Act, I remember uh, driving through the Deep South with my family uh, right after the Civil Rights Act was passed. And we stopped at a gas station and like, where's the bathroom? Because no, no doors had bathroom, you know, said men right. or women. And they look at us and give us the key to a door and it's, it would say like employees only or something. My dad explained to me that the way they were adapting to the new law against separate bathrooms was, you know, they would cryptically label every bathroom 
and then size you up and give you the key appropriate to, to you know to you to your ethnicity. So we've come a long way. Um, and, and, and yeah, it's no, and it's, it's remarkable. I mean, I've read I've read a number of bloggers and pundits who I didn't think of as you know I didn't think of them as that old. They aren't that old. Sort of sharing memories. I was just reading Rod Dreher on CrunchyCon talking about you know growing up in Louisiana and you know seeing seeing the recently uh, painted over s- signs in the bathrooms. I mean, it's just it's just not that long ago. Yeah. And you know, hey, uh, you know, it sticks it to the Europeans. I mean, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a red-blooded conservative, I can definitely feel good about that. Yeah. Let's see you handle your ethnic problems. That's right. Damn it. <laughs> I don't see any black prime ministers floating around Western Europe right now. Nope, not a one. So, so there we go. So that's good. Okay. So um, it's all good. Now, uh, before we talk about the Republican Party, I was wondering, you know, uh, my friends John Judas and Rui Tashira wrote this book, uh, a few years ago, the emerging Democratic majority, and they predicted, well, an emerging Democratic majority. They may have predicted it showing up a little earlier than now, but I'm not that familiar with their argument, uh, and I assume you are, and I'm wondering, have they been vindicated? Because uh, the standard read on this election is that, is that it has more to do with kind of transient things, you know, the economy, Bush. Uh, they had a, a more fundamental demographic argument, right? Right. right. I mean, their, their argument was basically that if you start with the George McGovern coalition in 1972, which at that point was a terrible coalition on which to run for president, a coalition of upper-middle-class white liberals and minorities, basically. Um, if you start with that coalition and just follow it down through the last thir- now 35, 36 years of American history, the coalition gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches a point where Democrats can win a real and significant majority just based on you know, winning, winning the African-American vote overwhelmingly, winning the Hispanic vote handily, um, winning over upper middle class professionals especially and they made an interesting distinction between the transition in the upper middle class from managerial professions to uh, managerial jobs to professional jobs and you know if you're sort of in middle management you're going to be a republican but if you're a lawyer for instance or a doctor or a teacher increasingly you're likely to be a democrat um, and you know I mean it dovetails and with arguments that other people have made from David Brooks's, you know, Bobo's in Paradise to Richard Florida's Rise of the Creative Class, the idea that there's this increasingly socially liberal upper middle class that votes Democratic um, in part because they're less tax sensitive than mm-hmm. the upper middle class used to be, in part because the Democratic Party has moved to the center on taxation and because the Republican Party had cut taxes to the point where the issue was less salient and so on, in part because, um, and this dovetails with some of the arguments in our book, but in part because of uh, declining crime rates, um, especially if you look at like the, de- the decline of the Northeastern Republican in a lot of places like New Jersey and, and now New York City, too, and the outer boroughs and so on, it, it tracks with the decline in crime rates. So all of these things... All of these things push the upper middle class increasingly into the Democratic column. They're, they're socially liberal. They tend to be pro-choice, increasingly pro-gay rights. Um, and then the white, this leaves the Republican Party with as the party of the white middle class and white working class, mm-hmm. which is a declining share of the electorate year by year, year by year. Um, and what that means is that the, the Democrats can't win without part of the white working class, but first they need a supermajority in the 70s, and they don't. if they don't get it, they lose. Then they just need mm-hmm. a majority, and now we've reached a point where they don't need a majority. They, don't, they just need a significant minority to put, to put them over the top. So, so that's, that's, the, that's the sketch. Now, um, one of the interesting things, you know, the, well, interesting is one way to put it. One of, one of the interesting debates is over the role of 9-11 in all of this, because Judas and Teixeira, I think, and they can come on and correct me if I'm wrong, would say that basically what happened is their thesis was correct, and then it was delayed by mm-hmm. 9-11, because mm-hmm. 9-11 dramatically heightened Mm-hmm. All demographic groups' sympathies for for the Republican coalition. You know, you had. I mean, in two thousand and four, George Bush did better in New Jersey, for instance, than he than any Republican had done in a while. And that mm-hmm. was that he, he didn't win it, but that was a symptom of a larger national security related turn that proved to be temporary. They mm-hmm. said, par- largely because. Um, well, poss- partially because it would have been temporary no matter what, also because of how the Iraq War went, and that now we're sort of returning to 
the Judas Teixeira uh, model. Now, Judas himself was very skeptical about Barack Obama, um, as, as mm-hmm. you may have noticed throughout this campaign, arguing that basically, yes, this, demog- this majority is emerging, but you can't nominate a guy named Barack Hussein Obama to lead it because it pushes too many of the white working class voters back into the Republican column, it, you know, and, and it, it may not, they, Hispanic voters may not turn out for an African American and so on. <coughs> Um, and obviously it didn't play out that way. I think there's still a good argument to be made that Hillary Clinton probably would have exceeded Barack Obama's overall vote totals. Mm -hmm. Um, But nonetheless, if you look at the way the Democrats won this election, John McCain um, almost matched uh, George Bush's performance, and again, all these numbers (laughs) are provisional, but almost matched George Bush's performance among whites, um, and basically Bush had overperformed among Hispanics and Asians and even among African Americans in 2004, all of those voters came back to the Democratic fold and Democratic numbers went up. Um, the Democrats are consolidating the college-educated vote, and so you have the Republicans left with a sort of shrinking white working class uh, rump. So. Yeah, so um, so they... they so Judas and Tashir got the demographics about right. Uh, their, their formula seems to uh, assume uh, that, that the Democratic the Democratic Party, to, to, to sustain their formula, it seems to me pretty much has to, can't be too anti-immigration, right? Yes. Um, and I assume somebody's pointed out a potential tension between, say, the black vote and a strong uh, pro-immigration policy if... if, if uh, and for that matter, the uh, you know working class whites. I mean, anybody who perceives immigrants as a threat to wages. Yes. Well, this uh, was this was that was actually Bruce Bartlett the, um, wrote wrote a book about the Democratic Party and race. And in his conclusion, he argued that Republicans should use the immigration issue to peel African American voters away f- from from the Democrats, which in the age of Obama is very unlikely to happen. But it reflects that kind of you know conservatives looking for. Looking for wedges in mm. in that in that emerging coalition, and the Bush oh. and the Bush administration's quest for the Hispanic vote was motivated by precisely that theory that you mm. have to win more and more Hispanics to prevent this this majority from emerging. Okay, well, as we uh, th- this gets to the issue of um, uh, party realignment, I, I still have the sense that we're we're kind of in for some sort of realignment. It, 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 it just there's a there's a kind of a lack of coherence right now I I, I think um, but let's let's talk about your book in that context and your prescription in that context I mean one thing I want to get to in at some point in this conversation is what what sort of realignment there has to be for your model to um, to to prevail but first why don't you describe your model I gather from this uh, dialogue you did with Jonah Goldberg that First of all, you and Raihan in in your book in, in in Grand New Party are on particular side of a basic debate within the Republican Party, which is was the problem this year that they were not conservative enough, right? You know, or that they were too conservative in the sense of not paying enough attention to to issues of, uh, of you know income distribution and right. stagnant wages and and economic insecurities uh, in in the middle and, and lower classes and so on, right? Right. I mean, you have this, you know, you, you could, the simplest way to characterize it is just sort of retrenchment versus reform as a model for, for the GOP going forward. But I think that, I think, yeah, your your point is basically right, that I'm, I'm in the group that thinks that the Republican Party needs a new message or, or and new policy ideas that focus on a sort of nest of interlocking domestic issues, health care, social mobility, education, and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there is another camp um, that, that thinks that um, the, the problem for Republicans is straightforwardly that they have spent way too much money in the Bush years on domestic concerns and that they've diluted the brand to the point where Americans would like to vote for a small government party, but they're not going to vote for a conservative party that gives you big government light, and therefore they've rejected the Republicans and are either voting for the Democrats or staying home. There's a a big op-ed in the Washington Post today by Representative Jeff Flake 
for instance, making exactly this argument, and it's one you hear a lot from House Republicans and a lot from conservative talk radio and from a lot of conservative pundits. I think it's probably the the dominant theory um, on the Republican side at the moment, and I'm in the sort of minority uh, heretical theory. Okay. And where exactly does David Frum's uh, book fit into this argument? Well, this gets into sort of... <laughs> It's we're, This is the great thing about being entering the political wilderness. You end up in this sort of endlessly splitting phenomenon like communist parties in the late 19th century. So, so, so there's sort of a large group of people, right, who thinks that, okay, the GOP needs a new domestic message and it's not, we haven't just lost because of earmarks and spending. In fact, we've lost because the issues that mattered in the 80s and 90s don't matter anymore and there's a new set of issues, et cetera. So, and David Fromm and I would agree on that sort of big picture. The question then becomes where, um, what, what issues, what domestic issues should you focus on and which constituencies should the Republican Party be trying to peel off? Mm-hmm. And uh, f- there's, there's actually a fair amount of overlap, I think, between some of Fromm's ideas and some of the ones in mine and Raihan's book. But Fromm's, I think, is much more focused on um, winning back the upper middle class. And Raihan and I, I'd say, are more focused on consolidating the white working class and then expanding <clears throat> into um, Hispanics, Asians, um, you know, ideally African Americans, though, again, not terribly likely <laughs> in the next four to eight years. But, <laughs> but so from, from, again, everybody's got their op-eds out. From has a piece, I think, in the National Post in Canada, basically making the case that, look, the Republicans need to compromise on abortion and the environment and some issues like that because these are the issues that the upper middle class cares about. Um, and, you know, I think Ryan and I would be more likely to say that, you know, you're probably not going to you're more likely to make hay with a sort of working class focused strategy and also that you know we think that there's sort of that there are legitimate problems facing the working class that conservative solutions would be helpful for and you know therefore that that makes sense as a focus of government policy sort of irrespective of the electoral landscape okay and 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 if from is willing to uh compromise on abortion, he's willing to part company to some extent with the social conservatives, I gather, and right. I think you you uh, you are not so eager to part company with them, right? I mean, that, that would be that would be part of your coalition? Yeah, I mean, I just don't, I don't see I mean, I'm, I'm, what sh- I'm pro-life, I'm also a sort of you know, a sort of temperamentally squishy person who's always trying to come up with interesting compromises <laughs> that probably have no chance of ever happening, but you know, I, I think there are things, there are sort of rhetorical things that Republicans can do on abortion that can make a difference in terms of winning over sort of lukewarmly pro-choice suburban voters, sure. Um, I think the problem for Republicans with abortion is just that the debate, the national debate, always tends to start and end with Roe versus Wade. And I don't see a way, it, it's, it, it's just an, an either-or situation. If Roe weren't on the books, if you actually had sort of normal political debate about abortion, then I think that, you know, you'd have sort of strict pro-lifers and then you'd have sort of squishy, you know, compromise-seeking pro-lifers like myself, and then you'd have squishy compromise-seeking pro-choicers, and you, the party could sort of move within that range, and, you know, are you supporting a ban in the first trimester, or are you supporting only a ban in the second trimester, and so on. As long as the debate is about Roe, and it's not going to stop being about Roe as long as Roe's on the books, I don't see any real maneuvering room for the national party. I mean, Frum has the idea that you need to get rid of the... Uh, the human life amendment plank in the Republican platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and from what I'm told by conservatives, that's, you know, if, if doing that is the sort of thing, it's one of these things that the activists care way, way more about than the general electorate. So you sort of provoke an endless convention fight, and it's not clear that that's really hurting you in the general election. I mean, how mm-hmm. many people voting for or against John McCain really knew what the Republican platform said? But but so that's uh, that's sort of the kind of thing that, from is suggesting. I think anything beyond that, then you're just sort of talking about jettisoning the pro-life vote. And I mean, obviously, as a pro-lifer, I'm not going to be in favor of that. But I also think it's electorally, you're not going to have a conservative party in America that isn't more on the pro-life than on the pro-choice side, because America's, the percentage of Americans that's pro-life has remained roughly constant and maybe even inched up over the past what is years. What is that percentage? Oh, well, you know, it depends how you define it. But I'd say anywhere from 25 to 35 percent, I think, mm-hmm. would fall into a pro-life category, and then you've got 
probably 40 to 45 percent that's pro-choice and another chunk in the middle. The question is, you know, the middle sort of can expand or contract, um, but the constituency for, you know, the constituency for, well, it's one of these, again, I'm talking too much, but one of these endlessly complicated things where the constituency for Roe is very large. The constituency for what Roe actually says is much smaller, and so pro-lifers sort of go back and forth on on what, you know, how many Americans are actually pro-life. But even if you define it incredibly narrowly as Americans um, straightforwardly opposed to Roe, not knowing what it means, you're still dealing with a large enough chunk of the country that one of the two political parties is going to try and get those votes. Um, the... Uh Okay, and do you happen to, to, to agree uh, with uh, an argument I made a few years ago after the 04 election, actually, and I'm not really, I'm less and less sure that I'm willing to stand behind this, but was that uh, a motivating force for a lot of the pro-life people is not really the philosophical position on abortion per se, but more the view that people, that, that abortion accompanies promiscuity and the breakdown of values generally. I mean, a high school teacher of mine in Texas uh, once said that uh, the people who favor abortion are the people who, as he put it, want to have their fun and not pay for it. Kind of a grim view of what parenthood is, but anyway, um, the, the, uh, the, the, does that make sense to you? That, 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 that really, if, if well, well, my large argument was if, if liberals could convey that, look, liberal parents, many of them, are concerned about the values that prevail in high schools in terms of, you know, sexual promiscuity, if they could convey that uh, to some conservatives, the conservatives would, uh, the, 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 that choice would be a less, uh, less of a kind of a dividing issue. I think that that's less true than it used to be. I, I'm, I'm certainly less convinced, uh, judging by the fact the, that the, the, the pro-life forces pregnancy. love Sarah Palin's yeah. pregnant daughter. You know. No, I mean, I, I, think, that, I, I think that what you're seeing um, over the last 30 years in post-sexual revolution is the gradual disentanglement of Christian ethics regarding life mm -hmm. from patriarchal superstructures that mm -hmm. were not necessarily related to Christianity. I mean, you know, I think... And, and this gets into sort of deeper, deeper historical and theological waters. But I think that Christianity um, in Western society and in all societies really has tended to be more patriarchal than the precepts of Christianity require just because most societies tend to be patriarchal historically. Mm -hmm. um, and so you had a, you've had sort of, I mean, you see this in the debate over over virginity, too, and, um, and and sex before marriage, where you have sort of, you know, the idea of people restoring their virginity, right, born-again virgins, which is, I think, a similar case where it's sort of a sort of patriarchal idea where, you know, you have sort of this idea, well, all right, that's, that's okay. sort of, let, okay. let's, uh, let, let, me, let me trail off, <laughs> trail off okay, well, well, on that me, one, but no, but I, I think, to, to the bigger point, I think that as, if, if you, you know, in 1977, I think mm -hmm. the phenomenon you're describing would, would be much more powerful, like opposition to abortion as, you know, well, you know, those girls who can't keep their legs closed, they yeah. deserve what they get. Yeah. I think that that has declined precipitously, dramatically, and, you know... Because more parents have grown up in an atmosphere of sexual promiscuity and take that for granted. Take, and take that for granted, and also yeah. because, you know, the, the pro-life movement has become... You know, initially there was no pro-life movement in America, right? In 1968, mm -hmm. nobody had any sort of conception of um, the idea that this would be an organizing, an organizing, galvanizing political cause. Mm -hmm. As it becomes an organizing and galvanizing cause, the people who are drawn to it are not people who are drawn to it for secondary reasons. They're drawn to it for primary reasons. Um, and I think, you know, so so I, I think I think that balance that balance has shifted. Now I think that there is and remains a sort of conservative case against abortion that's sort of independent over this debate over the moral status of the fetus and, and mm -hmm. a debate that an argument that says look you know the, the correlation of the um, relaxed abortion laws have an impact on sexual behavior and it's not a coincidence that the you know, that Roe versus Wade happened during and coincided with a long uptick in the rate of teen pregnancies because you know lots of people it affects sexual behavior even when people aren't deciding to actually have the abortion but that okay. I think that argument um, though I think it has some truth to it is less important as a motivating factor for the pro-life cause now I mean I, I think that you know there is 
most most serious committed pro lifers in America are you know they're in it for the fetuses. Yeah. Um, okay. So on um, well, family values more broadly, I guess you might say it. it I gather part of the argument uh, that you and Raihan make in in the book is that uh, you know w whether whether or not promiscuity per se is a real uh, motivating force in the way that it used to be. The um, the sense of breakdown of families per se, uh, uh, or you know the, the, uh, the lack of stability of families, the divorce rate, whatever. Uh, still is, is something that should be addressed. And in your Republican Party, I think, as I understand it, would be addressed uh, via kind of economic policies, right? Right. And whether, whether those policies would actually work is a completely, completely open question. And it's something that, you know, there's, some, there's experimentation along these lines going on in Britain. David Cameron's Tories have proposed some ideas similar to what Ryan and I have proposed. I mean, their ideas, the, the trouble is, there's very little evidence that sort of straightforward marriage promotion programs really have that much much impact. And the Bush administration put a little bit of money into some of these programs. And I don't, I, I shouldn't paint with too broad a brush. Some of them may be, some of them may be successful, but mm -hmm. um, but there's there, there are just limits to what government can do directly. So then you're sort of left with, well, what can government do indirectly? in terms of how the tax code is structured, how the health care system is structured, and so on, to relieve the kind of economic strains that, you know, create a sort of cy cycles of family breakdown, basically, that, you know, create, that provide the impetus for divorce, and pet children of divorced parents are more likely to have kids out of wedlock themselves, and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But all of the things we're proposing are... You know, they're all about sort of sharpening the incentives, basically, to get married, stay married, and so on. You know, so we we talk about you know family family friendly tax reform, where National Review's Ramesh Panuru is promoting ideas for um, you know a much larger per child tax credit. Um, so essentially, in, in conservative terms, um, it's sort of taking the conservative argument in favor of low low taxes on investment and applying it to it to investment in children and basically arguing that, you know, if, if we think of people investing in business as investing in the future of the country, we should think about people investing in raising a child as doing the same. Um, but then that carries through to sort of issues, I mean, issues ranging from the seemingly kind of small bore, like the fact that America's transportation infrastructure is not has not coped with the growth in America's population, and you have enormous, enormous commuting times now in a way you didn't have 25 years ago. And you don't think of that as an issue that affects American families, but in fact it does. It, you know, it places a sort of daily small bore but heavy strain on the fabric of family life. And then you go through to like you know to healthcare, where we have sort of. Um, I mean, I, th I think. Our, our view is that sort of the generic view that now liberals and conservatives both share, that having health care be portable from job to job would similarly have sort of, I mean, it would be good for the economy, but it would also have salutary impacts on parents, you know, dealing with dealing with getting health insurance for their children when they switch jobs and, and so on and so forth. So so it's stuff like that. But but look, I mean, the, the bigger picture is that, um, you know, we think that, that family breakdown is a threat to... Uh, a threat to the conservative view of what America should be, that mm -hmm. an America in which you have, you know, in, in which marriage is an, an exception rather than a rule in terms of family structure and in which parents are raising kids alone, in which parents are, children are living with two-parent families, that's an America where more and more people are going to vote for a larger and larger welfare state, ultimately. And that, in a sense, this sort of American experiment in free market capitalism depends on these stable intermediate structures that it, I mean, and, and these range from churches and community organizations down to the family, but the family is, is central. So, Okay. So you so you pay attention to the economic needs of lower and middle income people in your prescription. You you do it in a in a family friendly way. Um, the people who pay attention to those economic needs uh, sometimes shade into uh, populism and economic nationalism. Right. And so where do you come out on on trade and and class warfare? <laughs> Well, you're, class, you're, I assume you're not in favor of class warfare. We're, I, I, you're well, not ready to, to create a Republican Party that's in favor of that, I assume. Well, I, I mean, 
I, I'd say I'm more in favor of class warfare than I am a, the, in favor of protectionism, certainly. I mean, we don't really talk about... Uh, w- one of the things in our book is I think it, it comes off to many conservatives as more centrist or even left-wing than we actually are because we just sort of don't talk about the issues where we mm-hmm. basically think the GOP coalition has it right. Um, and trade is one is one of those issues. I mean, I think part of what we're talk, part of what we're arguing for in the book is a sort of a smart populism that tries to, you know, actually have a, a smart populism that has policies that that produce ultimately greater support for free trade in the long run. And we we make the argument that is borne out, I think, in a lot of recent studies that you know if. if if, if you look at working class Americans in general, and obviously this isn't true for specific industries, but in general, um, the benefits of free trade, even if it just means sort of the low prices at Walmart in terms of buying household essentials, have been one of the few really good things that have been happening to the working class in the American economy over the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so we're yeah, we're pretty pretty strong free traders on the class warfare front. I mean, you know, I, I would say that. Um, and th- this is an argument I haven't really developed, and we don't really get too deep into the entitlements debate in, in our book. But I think that conservatives, in especially with Social Security, but this is true with Medicare as well, um, are, are going to have to make a choice going forward in their debates with, with liberals in terms of, you know, look, you have these programs that are getting steadily more expensive and headed towards insolvency. There's going to be some kind of a left-right compromise on... Um, on what uh, you know, what what the future shape of these programs are, and conservatives with social security reform, Bush tried to pursue two conservative objectives at once. He wanted a more a leaner, more means tested social security with private accounts sort of tacked onto it. Um, and I think that the push for private accounts, at least in the short term, is probably dead because of the, the Wall events. Street. Yeah, the events in yeah. the stock market. It's, it's not looking like it would have been a good idea to start doing that uh, four or six years ago. No, which means that you know, which means I think that conservatives should focus on the idea that you know, look, if the welfare state isn't going away, what kind of welfare state do conservatives want? Well, you want a welfare state that produces the smallest government intervention in the economy possible. And so you want um, you want the most means-tested welfare state possible. You want mm-hmm. uh, you want a, a welfare state that isn't just moving large sums of money around between middle-class 28-year-olds and middle-class 70-year-olds. And so with the government just sort of fulfilling an ultimately kind of pointless role, you want you want a welfare system, you want a, uh, an entitlement system where Social Security is really a hedge against severe poverty in old age. And this is obviously a hobby horse of your of your frequent dialoguer, Mickey Kaus, but it's a place where I think sort of center-right and center-left can come together. But part of making the argument for that, for, for that kind of shift, requires, in a sense, I think, conservatives to contemplate talking in terms that they're used to attacking Democrats for doing. And if you look at how John, John McCain, for instance, uh, made some gestures in the sort of means testing and Medicare direction in this campaign, and sure enough, he framed it by saying, I don't think, you know, Warren Buffett needs these large Medicare payments. And I think that that's something conservatives, if they want to, if they want to make progress in a conservative direction on this front, are going to have to become more comfortable with saying. Mm-hmm. But, you know... We'll see. So, so okay. So, free trade. I mean, I, 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 in terms of party realignment, the reason I ask about free trade is it seems to me there's an open question about how a couple of issues could play out right. in terms of which party uh, they move toward, and that will determine the shape of any realignment. One of them is trade. It, it seems to me uh, there are anti-trade elements. Uh, you know, there are economic nationalists elements uh, in both parties now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then immigration is, is another one that's ambiguous in that regard. Um, and and what's, your, what, what, what's your line on immigration? You know, squishy compromise. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that I, I think that the it's a, it's, it's a similar case in a sense to abortion in that you, you have a two-party system in the country um, the Republican Party is the Conservative Party. It's the party of law and order, and it has it, it it has to it simply has to be the party of border security in some sense. I think, and I think that this is, you know, this has been a huge credibility problem for our Republican elites with the Republican base going back to the Reagan amnesty in the 1980s and continuing through the debate over comprehensive immigration reform. Um, and I think, you know, it 
it sounds much easier in theory than it is in practice, but I think the you know the basically the obvious thing for Bush to have done would have been right after 9/11, when everybody was obsessing over national security, to say, all right, we're going to pump a lot more money into border security and see if we can get the overall immigration numbers down. Mm-hmm. And then, assuming that he that assuming that that was successful, and I think there's reason to think it would be. I think you've seen with some stepped up border spending over the past couple of years, and obviously with the economic downturn, that you know the rates the rates of, of inflow from Mexico are not you know it's not inevitable that it's going to be a million people a year, and you're never going to get it to zero, and you wouldn't want to get it to zero, but you can get it down a certain distance, and then if you can get it down a certain distance, then you have the credibility to you know, to take to take the step of figuring out what to do with people who are already here. And I don't, so, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a particular problem in the long run with, with some form of amnesty. I think that's probably probably what you have to do. But I think that, you know, fr- from the point, of, and this is from the point of view of conservatives. I think the Democrats have, you know, are in a, are in a somewhat different position on on this issue. Um, yeah. But I think so, from so, the point of view of conservatives, it's just a case where, it, in theory, it seems like you should be able to split the difference, but. Or do you know? Try one thing, see if you can get get it, get the credibility, do another. But that didn't happen, and now the party's out of power, and now, well, now we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay. So on immigration, it, it sounds like you, you, you would do something that might that the the business uh, the business class might find at least mildly annoying. I mean, on the one hand, you're not you're not yeah. embracing Buchananite aversion to foreign, you know, influence, uh, that part of the conservative uh, spectrum. On the other hand, what, what you're saying, you would have, you would create a little tension with the, the business backers of, of uh, you know, something like amnesty or not? You probably would, you probably would have to, yeah. But yeah. I think you'd have to sell it to them with the argument that, you know, this is, if, if you know, in the long run, if you want a sort of, if you want this to be regularized in any sense, we're going to have to have lower numbers coming in, and we're going to have to have security. And maybe you know, maybe you can't make that sale, and maybe the Chamber of Commerce starts giving large sums of money to the Democrats. I think there are enough. The businesses that are, um, the businesses that are most concerned about about keeping the flow of cheap labor coming. Mm-hmm. I think generally are businesses that are not going to tip over, just run over to the Democrats. But I, you know, I could, I don't know enough about the politics on that front to say for sure. I think that you know, as long as the Republican Party is the party, you know, that's standing up against card check or something, you know, they can afford to sort of do a little more to 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 tick off businesses. But I'm I'm definitely not sure about that. Okay, so. But then the Democrats, I think, are, you know, the, the, the Democrats are in a different position. I mean, the Democrats are in a position where, demographically, the party stands to gain enormously from from uh, high from high immigration rates in a way that the Republicans don't. And I think right. that that changes the, the, the calculus. And I think you see that with, in a sense, with where organized labor has moved on the issue, where you'd think that organized labor would, would want to reduce... The inflow because you know they're sticking up for people who are already here, who already have jobs, and so on, and don't want to drive down wages. But in fact, that isn't exactly where the labor unions have gone. They've sort of seen this as an opportunity to sort of that it dovetails with their push for a broader reunionization of America. Mm-hmm. So, in your model, it sounds like there's not quite room in your Republican Party for what you might call um, hardcore economic and cultural nationalists, and there I just mean basically Buchananites. So. It's not your brand of populism doesn't appeal to them, right? Well, I mean, it de- it depends. I mean, it doesn't check all their boxes, no. But on the other hand, I mean, it, let's say let's say you're a hardcore, you know, you're a hardcore Buchananite, Buchananite, um, Buchananite populist. One, I think you might. Well, if you think that you can get like massive restrictions on trade and mm-hmm. a huge wall and nothing else on the Mexican border, then no, you have no reason to support our Republican Party. But if, probably neither if, party is actually neither party is actually going to offer that, right. um, especially since you know the the elites in the United States, as the Buchananite nationalists know well, are extremely hostile to Buchananite nationalism. Right. So if you're if you're going if you're going to those people and you're saying, look, you know, the Democrats are never going to do border security. We're going to do border security, and you know. Sh- we're, we're not we're not going to go protectionist, but here are some other ideas for how you know the the low wage American worker might might have a better time under our conservative administration. I think 
you know, I think there's there's a sale <coughs> there's a sale to be made there. Maybe, yeah. maybe not. You know, I, I mean, well, I guess the the counter argument would be that it, it sounds a lot like something that could plausibly emerge in the Democratic Party. So, uh, h- how many people would it really sway? I mean, that combination. In other words, something compromise-ish on immigration. I, I guess you're saying, no, that the, the Democrats are always going to open open the gates a little a little wider on the border. I th- uh, I think uh, so. Yeah. I on mean, trade, it sounds like they might not be very different from where you are, especially now that there are more and more uh, affluent people, I guess, in the Democratic constituency. I mean, Democrats increasingly have Wall Street and Silicon Valley. Um, so they're not they're not going to be uh, to your left on trade. Maybe, although uh, argue, uh, arguing against myself a little bit, I think one thing you have seen on trade in the past four or six years is the beginnings of upper middle class anxiety about outsourcing, mm-hmm, um, that's true. outsourcing of professional services especially. Yeah. And I think that, that that has driven, you know, obviously um, unions and other groups are driving a lot of the uh, Democratic primary support for, for renegotiating trade deals and so on. Mm-hmm. But I think that anxiety about free trade in the upper middle class is also pushing it. And you can imagine that that yeah, I mean that you know that in the in the future, if you're if you're a serious protectionist, the Democratic Party is the place to go. Yeah, it's it's a it's a form of trade that's particularly hard to stop it because it doesn't involve the flow of goods across border. I mean, in principles, you 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 can. It just seems to me a little a little a little harder to keep somebody from hiring a programmer in India, um, than, than to keep Indian goods from uh, from entering. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um, I I think look, I think it's. I think it's very hard. As a, as, a, as a cultural conservative, I have all sorts of cultural concerns about globalization, but I think that, you know, everything, I, I have yet to see any serious alternative in terms yeah. of, you know, if, 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 as long as you're still, as long as you're interested in economic growth. And yeah. I think okay. that our society, and again, as a, you know, as a cultural conservative, I sometimes, you know, I could imagine, you know, I have my sort of G.K. Chesterton distributist, like, you know, low growth, high solidarity society, utopian imaginings. But mm-hmm. in the America we actually have, our society's stability depends completely on large scale economic growth. And that's been true for a long, long time now. Mm-hmm. So... In your model, neither party really winds up hardcore uh, nationalist, probably. Um, uh, the other big issue that, that could swing from party to party is kind of foreign policy, I mean, in principle. Right. Uh, the, you have hawks in both parties, and sometimes what's the difference between a humanitarian interventionist and a neocon, and so on. Um, and that is something in your book i guess you're more or less agnostic on right well right yeah Raihan and i you know you you co-author a book and and you're not going to agree on everything and we thought i mean i think after 9-11 every single person on the right decided they wanted to write about foreign policy for obvious reasons and we sort of thought there was there was something to be said for writing a book that was just focused on domestic policy um Mm -hmm. But Raihan's a little bit more of a neoconservative, and I'm a little bit more of a realist. Um, and I think my my broad view, where the Republicans are concerned, is that foreign policy is a field where I'm uncomfortable with the idea that like there is a single ideological solution. That you mm-hmm. know, and if you just have a, if you only had an administration stocked entirely with neocons or with realists or with liberal internationalists or whoever, that you know every crisis would resolve itself in the best possible way. I mean, I think the thing you know and this is true with the Democrats, too, I think. But with Republicans, I think, you know, the most successful Republican administrations have had a fruitful tension between idealism and realism. And I, I think that, you know, and the, the problem with the Bush administration was that you had an unfruitful tension between idealism and realism, where it seemed like the idealists got their way when the realists should have, and the realists got their way when the idealists should have, and, and it yeah. all ended up being a fine mess. But I think that the basic paradigm that... You know, I mean, it is it is a Reaganite paradigm um, in the sense that you know you want an America that sort of the, there's sort of an idealistic baseline for the foreign for your foreign policy, um, but you want to be, I would say, more more prudent, cynical, and calculating um, in the imp- in implementation than I think the Bush administration has been. Yeah. But I mean, my but my own line it always sounds simplistic to say stop. You can have both, uh, but 
you know, I, it, it is the case that our fortunes are intertwined more than they used to be with peoples all over the world. Uh, so, for example, a collapsed state is really ultimately bad news for us, right? Because, uh, I mean, look at look look at look at Somalia right now. Okay, leaving aside that, you know. There might have been an argument for intervening long ago on humanitarian grounds to keep it from becoming what it's become. Right. But we now know there was an argument on realist grounds. It's a breeding ground for terrorists. So my own view is that if you uh, address issues uh, of American interest around the globe in a sufficiently enlightened fashion, you will wind up doing plenty of humanitarian, you know, at least as much as you can practically handle. So I would just make that the criterion. Right. You know, when is it in? A, you know, well, I mean, barring genocide or something. Right. Special cases. But in general, I would say, uh, you know, there there's there's a moral case that, that, that probably can can prevail regardless. But in general, I would just subject things to the test of American self-interest. And you'll find you're doing a lot to cure diseases and stop starvation and, and, and so on. Plenty. And, and, and just so I, 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 uh, I would personally make that kind of a litmus test. But. Yeah, it just seems tough to have. I mean, it seems like so often the litmus test just has to be prudence. You know, I mean, it's it's like... Well, sure, but but by that measure, is it worth the gain to American interest right. is the kind of prudence I would like to see. Yeah, the... no, 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 I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that I'm, you know, in my sort of realism, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with... Well, I, I guess, I mean, one, one of the things, and I was saying this to, to, to Jonah last time, I mean, I think sort of the biggest thing I've taken away from, from the Iraq war is just that, you know, you, you, you want to be careful about going all in. Um, you know, so I'm, and, and so essentially the bigger the operation, the more likely I think I would be to oppose it. Um, and that's well, true and of humanitarian and trends, and it's true of sort of straightforward... Um, you know, straightforward national interest, power politics. Right, and I think the less multilateral it is, the, uh, just on grounds of sheer uh, burden sharing, both sharing the financial costs and sharing the blowback and sharing, the, you know, the terrorist blowback and so on, I, I, I would make that a criterion. But so, so foreign policy for you is not... Um, it's not obvious where it falls on, on kind of uh, what you might call intellectual grounds. It, it's not... It's not Right. I mean, I mean, the, the domestic coalition you want to build, you yourself have a preference for realism. Uh, well, relative to the you of eight years ago, at yeah. least. Um, and uh, but but it's not it's not so organically foreign policy is not so organically tied to the Republican coalition you would like to build or other people would like to build as other things. Well, I mean, right? I think what's organically tied is a posture of of national strength. Um, mm -hmm. And but but I think that that's you know that's a very that's a very broad baseline, um, yeah. and I, I think that you know it's not. I mean, you're you're not going to be the party if you're the conservative party. You're not going to be the party of pacifism, and you know, and, and I think and I think that goes without saying. And you're also going to be the party that's I think more suspicious of multilateralism than the Democrats, and more suspicious of putting too much faith in international institutions, and more suspicious, I mean, I think, you know, and again, this doesn't really come into our book that much, but I mean, my, my, I have a personal bias against transnational institutions just on, you know, on, 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 well, on, on a variety of grounds, but, but I think that, you know, the, the Republican Party going forward is going to have to remain, it's going to be the party of, um, some form of stronger nationalism than the Democrats express. Okay, I've got a book I want you to read. I'll, I'll, um, I'll send it to you. Okay, sounds good. I can get free copies. Um, the, uh, the blogging head's empire is, as far as I can tell, all-powerful. Uh, well, when you wrote the book, it's easy to get free copies. Ah. <laughs> uh, um, the, the, uh, on transnational institutions, um, I, I'm, I'm more favorably inclined than you are. Okay, so who, um, what particular people... Uh, 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 what, what candidate is a good vehicle for the reconstituted Republican Party you would like to see? One person who's obviously going to be trying to gather a coalition around her is Sarah Palin. Yes, uh, yes, Sarah Palin. Does she work for you? Well, you know, I mean, I was I was a big Sarah Palin fan when she was governor until of she opened her until she opened her mouth. Well, now? the Katie Kirk interview was uh, not 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 the finest hour for an American politician. I, I mean, I think the thing with Sarah Palin is. I let's ask ask me again in six months. I think we'll know a lot more about Sarah Palin um, for good or ill 
um, once she's no longer part of the McCain campaign. So she hasn't really had to declare, as governor, she didn't have to declare on enough issues for you for it to be clear. Well, to you. On governor, as governor, I mean, Alaska is such a bizarre state. She didn't really declare on any issues of, mm-hmm. of, of national significance. But I think the way she the way she governed, broadly speaking, um, mm-hmm. governing from sort of a kind of radical center kind of position, um, and sort of taking the Alaska. I mean, she you know she was not. I mean, she was she was running against corruption and so on. Running, I mean, she she wasn't the killer of earmarks that the McCain campaign made her out to be, but she was a killer of earmarks by the standards of of uh, Alaska politics. But she but she was also someone who you know was willing to stick it to the oil companies in in, yeah. in renegotiations in a way that I think um, a lot of conservatives would be uncomfortable with. Basically, she what what she displayed as governor was a real pragmatic streak. Yeah. With no particular, it wasn't pragmatism necessarily in the direction I'd like the GOP to go, but it was pragmatism that, you know, demonstrated the potential that I think Republican politicians at this moment need. Now, as a candidate for vice president, um, she did something else. She sort of became, um, she became the base rallying figure that the McCain campaign decided she should be. I mean, we just don't. We, we just really don't you know. You don't know enough. whether she's intrinsically a cancer on the Republican Party, as David Brooks put it. You don't, you don't know whether she's intrinsically so kind of anti elite. Uh, anti elite is to seem anti intellectual or whatever. Yeah, I don't think we know anything really on, on that score. I mean, I think the McCain, you know, to what extent was she responsible for her own speeches and the things she said? You know, who knows? To what extent also, I mean, I think what, what Brooks was talking about there almost, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but had less to do with Palin herself than to the reaction to her among conservative pundits, who the people who were unwilling to acknowledge right. how bad her interview had been or un, unwilling... Right, right, yeah, it's funny because when he said, he, he depicted her as anti-ideas, and I had not gotten that from her in an explicit way, right? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think that she... I, I think what he... I think it's more that... In you know, in defending in defending her qualifications for the presidency, after um, you know a pretty poor showing on her part over a couple week long stretch, a lot of conservative writers indulged in serious anti intellectualism of their own. I mean, mm-hmm. Palin was just such she was just such a Rorschach test, and, and this was true on the left as well as the right. Um, and you know, I mean, my, my suspicion is that. My, my suspicion is that if she pursues a career in national politics, it will be as, you know, as the role that she played on the campaign trail, because that's where her strongest supporters are. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think if Sarah Palin wanted to be president of the United States, the smartest thing for her to do, well, there are like, you know, 16 different things she should do. But in terms of seeking out political advice, she should go for political advice to a lot of the people who said negative things about her performance on the campaign trail. I don't think that's usually how it works with politicians, though. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's that likely to happen. And I think if there were a Palin 2012 or 2016 campaign run, it would be more or less, it would be a more straightforward sort of, you know, reunite the talk radio right and the evangelical right, which sort of split between Romney and Huckabee in this. Now, is that an easy thing to now tell me what that means? I mean, Rush Limbaugh is what more more economically libertarian than the evangelicals generally, and so there's generally a split there. Well, I don't think there's generally a split there. I think, you know, I think that there there's the potential for a split there. There hasn't been in the past because, uh, you know, I I think even you know evangelicals statistically tend to be more small government oriented than, than the average American Christian. And so there's sort of... There, well, why has, Limbaugh, why has Limbaugh not been appealing to them or vice versa? Well, what happened in this campaign was that um, Huckabee, for sort of straightforward identity politics reasons, became the candidate of evangelicals. Um, and Huckabee was, you know, more of an economic populist. And Limbaugh doesn't like economic populists. Okay. So Limbaugh attacked Huckabee. And, okay. and Romney, I mean, you know, to the extent that anyone was the favorite of the sort of talk radio segment, it was Fred Thompson, but then when he wasn't going anywhere, they ultimately sort of rallied around Romney. Romney wasn't going to get the evangelicals because he was a Mormon, so you had sort of a fissure. Palin, though, as an evangelical and as someone who talk radio rallied around, um, I think... You know, has has the potential to sort of knit knit that divide back up. I, I just don't think. You know, I, who who knows? If Barack Obama is a disastrous president, then 
any kind, lots of things become possible for Republicans in the future. My suspicion, though, is that the next Republican president will be someone who, you know, is is even is even in their primary campaign finding a way to reach out to the center, which is what Bush did in 2000 and what none of the candidates did this time around. And maybe maybe Palin can do it. I I really like Sarah Palin, um, and I would really like to she's see. She's a maverick. She's. No, I think she's. You know, she's she's a great American story. I think you know whatever whatever you think of the fact that she accused Barack Obama of palling around with terrorists or whatever else she said that you know infuriated. Mm. It, it also was, it also uh, seemed to me in this the exchange with Brian Williams that she didn't know what the word preconditions means after complaining a hundred times that Barack Obama would negotiate without preconditions. But look, uh, leave, leave her aside. I mean, tastes will differ. Uh, with regard to Sarah Palin, um, I, 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 I um, yeah, yeah, just leave it that. We'll, leave, say, we'll leave it at that. We'll agree to disagree. But yeah, we're, we're at an hour. Let me so let me ask you one more question. So it seems like uh, Huckabee would wed economic nationalism with the evangelicals. You, you're, you're not big on that. Sarah Palin might wed economic internationalists with the evangelicals. You'd be big. You could you could you could be a big fan of hers in that event. Leaving her aside, is there somebody there who embodies the Republican Party you want to see right now and is a, a prominent, is a possible leader, whether or not a possible presidential candidate? Look, I mean, it's, you know, everybody says this, um, and it's boring to say, but there's a reason everybody likes Bobby Jindal. Um, and the reason is that he is someone who, he, he, checks, he checks a lot of boxes politically. He is, you know, socially conservative pro-life and so on. He is, um, you know, make, making free market reforms, which is easy to do in a state like Louisiana that's been run as a one-party state for so long. But he's also someone who is incredibly good. At, he's a policy wonk. Mm -hmm. um, and he's someone who, you know, has made sort of noises on, on, on health care that, um, you know, I think, I mean, he had He's not sketching out a national agenda, but that I think point towards the kind of reformism that I think the Republican Party needs. Um, and you know, it doesn't hurt that he's that he's an Indian American, and that you know, if you look at the Republican Party right now, it has a real problem with non-white Americans, and it looks like a party of of you know boring old white guys. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure it's having a problem with with Indian Americans. That's an no, they did. I well, no, Asians. I, I don't know how they break it out, but my quick look at the. Well, I think there's a difference. But I mean, but, but I mean, it, I, there's there's a difference, but I'm not sure there's a difference in the uh, in the exit polls that I was right, looking right. at. And but but um, but yeah. So you know, I mean, I think that I think that you could see Jindal running the kind of campaign I think a Republican candidate would need to win, and he's done a good job of sort of staying in the you know being in the good graces of the sort of more doctrinaire um, talk radio. Let's get back to Reagan mm -hmm. Reagan conservatives. I mean, I think you know. Jeb Bush in a world where George W. Bush had not been a not failed been president, president yeah. would be would be a natural figure. I think he was a great governor of Florida and also, uh, you know, is is a policy wonk. I mean, I think the baseline here, and I've, I've said this before, is just that I think the Republican Party needs to be, you know, is going to remain a sort of populist party going forward. It's going its base is going to be the white working class, and that's mm -hmm. going to mean that you're going to have more figures like Palin, like Huckabee, like Tim Pawlenty, with, you know, the, who coined the term Sam's Club conservatism that we use in the book. You're going to have more figures like this. What this means, though, is it actually places a higher premium on having your spokesman be wonky. Mm -hmm. Because if your baseline is, we're the party of Joe Sixpack and Joe the Plumber and the white guys out in the heartland who, you know, um, you know wear trucker hats or whatever... Then, if you're then selling yourself beyond that base, whether you're selling yourself to, you know, upper middle class Hispanics or white suburbanites in Loudoun County or w w whatever you're doing, you have to you have to have your candidate sort of push against against this you know the sort of stereotype of anti intellectualism. And so, mm -hmm. what I think you're, the party is looking for, you know, it's looking for Mitt Romney running a totally different campaign than the campaign Mitt Romney ran. You know, mm -hmm. it's 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 looking for it's looking for populist wonks. That's what we need. Okay, so 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 you like Bobby Jindal. Sarah, Sarah Palin, uh, as she fleshes herself out, could wind up looking enough like him uh, for there to be a battle between them uh, for the for the honor of being the walking embodiment of your book, Grand New Party. Uh, and <laughs> that I would wish be them, nice. I wish them both luck. <laughs> And I wish you luck. Uh, it's a good opportunity. You know, you've got a good few weeks to get out and talk about your book, I would think. And, uh, 
Yeah, and, 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 and you deserve it. Well, I well I appreciate it, and I appreciate you taking the time to uh, yeah. To, to, I, to, I to, always to. learn a lot when I talk to you. Well, um, so thanks. Thanks, Bob. Great talking okay. to you. Okay. See you, Ross. See ya.